Our final speaker of the day is Peter Schweitzer, who serves as president of the Government Accountability Institute. And I hasten to add, he's for accountability, not against it. He is also a partner in Oval Office Writers, a speech writing and communications firm. In 2008 and 2009, he was a consultant to the Office of Presidential Speech Writing in the White House. He has also served as a member of the Ultra Terrorism Study Group at Sandia National Laboratories. He makes frequent appearances on radio and television, and he writes for many publications, including Foreign Affairs and the Wall Street Journal. He's also a prolific author of many books, academic and popular, including The Reagan Presidency, Assessing the Man and His Legacy, uh, and his most recent book, which caused quite a stir uh, when it appeared, is Clinton Cash, The Untold Story of How and Why Foreign Governments and Businesses Helped Make Bill and Hillary Rich. I thought progressives were opposed to the 1%. Um, for our final lecture of this Hillsdale College National Leadership Seminar on the topic money and politics, please welcome Peter Schweitzer. Thank you for that warm introduction. It's uh, great to be here uh, and to be associated with such a fine institution as Hillsdale College. Now, back in 2011, something happened that really nobody paid attention to. You see, back in 2011, Washington, D.C. passed Silicon Valley to take the crown as the city in America with the highest per capita income. Washington, D.C., if you look at the 10 wealthiest counties in the United States, seven of those are counties that border our nation's capital. Washington, D.C., a couple years ago, passed Napa Valley, California for the consumption of fine wines. And to tell you how bad it is, let me give you an illustration from something I did uh, with Fox News a couple years ago. We did a special called Boomtown, where we went around and looked at the economy in Washington, D.C. and how it was booming. And one of the things we did in that program is we went and actually interviewed a car salesman who worked for a Ferrari of Washington, D.C. And you can find this on YouTube, by the way, this interview. And we talked to him. We said, how is business? He says, business is great. We are selling lots of cars. But he said, there's a problem. Ferrari of North America is upset with us. And I said, wait a minute. How can Ferrari of North America be upset with you? You're selling so many cars. He says, well, here's the problem. When people buy Ferraris in South Beach in Florida, they finance the purchase. When they buy them in Ferrari of Beverly Hills, they finance the purchase, and Ferrari of North America likes that. When they buy Ferraris in Washington, D.C., they pay cash. Now, we have come to the state in America where I would contend to you the size and growth in government is not just a function of liberal ideology. It's a function of profitability. Here's the basic problem. Big, obtrusive government is not only a dream for ideological liberals, it also creates potential opportunities for self-enrichment. And I want to talk to you today about some of the techniques they use. Uh, then I want to talk to you about the special case, what I would contend is the very special case of the Clintons and how they threatened to undermine the United States, the sovereignty of the country, the integrity of our political process in a way that no other political family, couple, or candidate has in American history. First of all, let's talk a little bit about self-enrichment. Anybody here been to Washington, D.C. recently? If you've been to Washington, D.C. recently, you will find that there are lots of construction trains, that the nicest restaurants in town are absolutely booked on a Wednesday night. It's hard to get in. Washington, D.C. is booming. And part of that is the size and the scope of government. You've just got more government employees, you've got more government contractors, but you have an additional problem. And that is that big government creates opportunity for making lots of money. And let me just give you a couple of examples. First one here, anybody involved in finance or corporate finance that has worked in that field? Uh, you all know, and I'm sure everybody else in this crowd knows, uh, that insider trading on the stock market is illegal, right? If you work for General Electric and you know in advance that the quarterly financials are coming out and GE is going to do very, very well, uh, you know, you better not buy GE stock in advance because if you do that on inside information or you share that information with somebody that, that does that, you are probably going to go to jail. But there's a loophole, particularly for those in Washington, D.C. If you are a U.S. senator, if you are a government bureaucrat, 
and the government, your agency, or your senatorial committee is going to make a decision that is going to affect dramatically the health of a major U.S. company, you as a senator are free to buy or sell stock in that company. It is not technically illegal for you to do so. How do we know they're doing it? Well, let me give you uh, um, some statistics from a study that was done a couple of years ago in something called the Journal of Quantitative Economics. Now, if you are looking to fall asleep at night and you're having trouble, I suggest you subscribe to the Journal of Quantitative Economics because I know next to nothing about math. But here's what they did in this study, and it's absolutely fascinating. They looked at how, pe how well people did in their stock market investing. And what they found is that the average American, which would certainly include me, actually tends to underperform the market in their stock picks. The average American usually doesn't do very well. The average corporate executive that's trading their own company's stock, they tend to beat the market by about 5% a year. So they actually do pretty well. They understand the industry. They understand their company. Hedge funds, the guys that not too far from here get paid very large fees, tend to beat the market averages by 7% a year. Now here's where the study gets interesting. United States senators, they tend to beat the market by 12% a year. So my question for you, fine audience, is are our U.S. senators just simply more brilliant than we give them credit for? That these guys should all be running hedge funds or is something else going on? And I would contend to you that something else is going on and there's ample evidence that it's going on. But it's not just a function of senators or elected officials trading stocks on the stock market and winning big. There is a growing industry in Washington that's even more profitable than lobbying or government relations, and that's something called political intelligence. Uh, now, for some of you, of course, political intelligence, you would consider that an oxymoron, but political intelligence is very simply this. It's usually an ex-politician or an ex-congressional staffer. They get paid by hedge funds to do what? To get information on what the government's going to do. So if there is a bill in the Senate uh, that's going to be beneficial to timber prices, you as a political intelligence operative would call your former colleagues and say, hey, is this bill going to pass? Is it going to pass without amendment? You would share that information with the hedge fund which would trade on that information. Or for example, if Medicare is going to change reimbursement rates on certain procedures that's going to have a dramatic effect on the profitability of certain healthcare companies, that's information that traders want to know. And so political intelligence is creating opportunities for what? It's creating opportunities for insides to profit from the complexity and the difficulty of operating in Washington, D.C. But let me give you a second example of how the size and growth of government has become enormously profitable, unfortunately, and I think it's one of the things that's fueling the complexity of the laws that we have. Everybody here is, is probably uh, uh, familiar with uh, Dodd-Frank, right? This was the big financial reform that was supposed to clean up Wall Street. It was supposed to create rules for uh, big Wall Street firms to make sure that we don't have happen what happened in 2008. Now, the last time this kind of overhaul took place was back in the 1930s under FDR. And when they reconfigured the entire financial system and the regulatory structure in the 1930s, the bill was what? 36 pages long. It was pretty easy to understand, pretty easy to comprehend. Well, along comes Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank is not 36 pages long. It's not 3,600 pages long. It's more like eight to 10,000 pages long, depending on how you calculate the information in it. And everybody from Warren Buffett to the smartest lawyers on Wall Street will tell you, this law can send people to jail, and we have absolutely no idea what these rules actually mean. Now, it'd be very easy to dismiss this and say, well, it just shows that you know, the people who wrote the legislation are incompetent, that um, you know, government is run amok, and I would contend to you that's part of it, but you also need to consider the fact that the boot rules were written that way for a reason. Why write complex, difficult rules that specialists can't understand? Because if you're the person that wrote the rule, you can quit your job and get hired as a consultant. And this is precisely what happened with Dodd-Frank. So the top advisors to, for Senator Dodd of Connecticut, who co-sponsored the bill, 
after the bill passed, they quit their jobs and they said, you know, if you want to understand what this law means, you can pay me a flat fee of $100,000 and I will tell you precisely what these rules mean. The equivalent is basically this. It's as if they wrote this bill in an ancient language like Sanskrit and said, you need to comply with this real law and if you don't, you can go to jail. If you're somebody on Wall Street, wouldn't you pay somebody $100,000 to translate it from Sanskrit? Of course you would. And that's precisely what is fueling the growing complexity and the growing difficulty of understanding and interpreting the rules that are being created in Washington, D.C. Again, what's happening in Washington and the size and scope of government is not just philosophical or ideological. It is profit-minded. Well, I've talked a little bit about the side of self-enrichment that's happening in Washington, D.C. Let me talk about another aspect of money in politics, and that is looking at the basic question of the amount of money that is flowing into political campaigns. It's really unprecedented, and you will find that a lot of people, when they discuss this issue, may have different ideas of what should be done, but I haven't found anybody who is not a little bit concerned by the fact that presidential campaigns now often take a billion dollars in order to execute. Donald Trump is changing that, or seems to be changing that in a little bit, by uh, sheer will of force. Uh, he's spending very little of his own money and seems to be doing well in the polls. But time will tell when we get to a general election if you still don't have to have hundreds of millions of dollars at hand to run for president of the United States. Now, what is the way in which we have always thought about money in politics? It's what I would call the Mr. Smith goes to Washington paradigm. Anybody here remember the great Jimmy Stewart movie, Mr. Smith goes to Washington? Great movie. Jimmy Stewart is appointed to the Senate. He's earnest. He's hardworking. He wants to do the honest thing. And yet there are these outside corporate entities that are trying to corrupt him. And this has been the paradigm that we have operated under for the last 40 years. That the problem is not the political class in Washington. The problem is corporate types. And if we could just protect uh, these wonderful young vessels that are running for political office from outside entities, we won't have a problem with corruption. In other words, the paradigm is one of bribery. Politicians get tempted by outside corrupting forces, they can't help it, and they end up basically going along with those corruptive forces. Well, that certainly does happen, but I would contend with you a much larger problem is what I call the extortion paradigm. And what is the extortion paradigm? Think about it in terms of economics. If you are a politician and you know that you need to raise money for election or re-election, and also you've got political action committees that you want to fund, and you can use, by the way, some of those PAC dollars to subsidize your lifestyle, so it can also make your quality of life better. What do you need to do as a politician in that kind of environment? You need to create a demand for your services, right? I mean, nobody's going to throw money at you because they like you. Some people will. In a lot of cases, you have to drum up support. Now, there are individuals, there are lots of individuals who give to candidates out of the pure motive of simply wanting to support somebody they like to get elected in office. And there are those individuals who uh, just basically give to politicians uh, because they think it's their civic duty to do so. But most surveys show that over 50% of people operating in a corporate environment don't contribute because they want to. They contribute because they feel like they have to. 58% in one survey of corporate executives said the reason they gave political contributions is because they felt if they didn't, bad things were going to happen to them. And this is precisely where the political class wants things. So my contention to you would be this. The problem for money in politics is not so much that you've got all these outside entities wanting to influence politicians and corrupt the process. What you've got are politicians who are creating a demand for their services by creating circumstances that force or compel outside entities to make contributions. Let me give you a couple of examples. First one. There's something in Washington, D.C. that is called a milker bill. Anybody here heard of a milker bill? Okay, a milker bill is something that has nothing to do with the dairy industry. It has nothing to do with cows. A milker bill is what it implies. It is a bill that is introduced to milk campaign contributions 
from either labor unions or from corporate entities. And so how does a milker bill work? Well, if I'm a committee chairman or a powerful senator, I introduce a bill. Best thing to do is a special tax on a key industry. So I introduce a bill to the high-tech industry saying, you know, I think Google and Microsoft and the high-tech sector needs to pay a special tax, a surtax, because they're making too much money. So I introduce that bill with great fanfare. What's going to happen? There's going to be a rush of lobbyists coming to my office saying, wait a second, why does Senator Schweitzer want there to be a special surtax or tax placed on the high-tech sector? And they're going to make all kinds of policy arguments about why it's a bad idea. It's going to hurt jobs, it's going to hurt competitiveness, et cetera, et cetera. But that assumes that I'm actually interested in the policy implications. If I've introduced a milker bill, I'm not interested in the policy implications. I'm interested in money. So after they make their arguments, I'm going to say, that's very interesting, thank you. I'm going to have to think about it. Well, the lobbyists quickly get the message. The way to get me to think about it is to, number one, maybe hire a family member as a lobbyist. A lot of people don't realize one out of three U.S. senators today, sitting U.S. senators, has an immediate family member that's a spouse or a son or daughter who is a registered lobbyist. And there are numerous examples to show how widespread this is and how ridiculous it is. But that's the first thing I'm going to hope that they're going to do, and that is hire maybe my son or my daughter or a relative as a lobbyist for their entity. The second thing I'm going to ask them to do is to raise money for me. And if they raise enough money to me and they show the commitment to me, I will withdraw the bill from introduction. But here's the great thing about a milker bill. I can reintroduce it again next year. And we can go through the same thing again. I can get the same contributions. I can create the revenue opportunities for my family members. And this system will work quite well. Now, the only thing better than a milker bill is a double milker bill. And what is a double milker bill? That's when you introduce a piece of legislation that pits two wealthy industries against each other. And then you let the arms race begin. And so let me give you a real-world example of this. In 2011, there was a bill introduced called SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act. Now, this was a bill that said that online companies like Google and Microsoft needed to be held into account if people online were selling counterfeit merchandise or if they were selling illegally downloaded music or movies that, that were pirated. Now, you know, this may sound like a great idea in, in theory. In practice, imagine how is Google going to police who shows up on their Google searches? But again, logic here is not the point. What SOPA did when it was introduced was it did two things. Number one, the recording industry and Hollywood loved it. And the high-tech industry, Google and Microsoft, fell into an absolute panic. And so what happened? The arms race began. President Obama, in particular, handled this masterfully. Because you know what he did? At the beginning of the introduction of this bill, the White House put the, took the position, we're going to think about it. We're not sure whether we support this or not. We're going to think about it. And that's a great place to be when there's a double milker bill in play. And that brings me to the question of the high-tech industry in itself when it comes to this whole model of extortion. And I think it's a great example of, of how political fundraising and lobbying has become so extortive. Back in the 1990s, the high-tech industry, Microsoft, Apple, and the others barely at all had a presence in Washington, D.C. They didn't make many campaign contributions. If they, if they did, it was not an organized executive. Uh, action by executives. It was something that individual employees made at their own behest. And they didn't even really have a lobbying presence. Microsoft had somebody working in suburban Maryland that was selling software to the government that occasionally, when needed, would go and meet with people on Capitol Hill. Then in 1998, the Justice Department said, we might have to break up Microsoft as a monopoly. Now, when this happened, forget the legal arguments for a second, that changed everything, and it created an extortive environment to where the high-tech industry, which essentially would prefer to be left alone by Washington, D.C., is today the largest contributor to political campaigns in Washington. 
And that is not by design. There are numerous quotes over the years from Republicans and Democrats that said, we need to let the high-tech industry know that they need us and that they need to support us. And they found a way to do that through these extortive practices. Now, how do you fix and deal with these issues and these problems? I would contend you it's not easy. But let me propose a couple of general suggestions before I get to the question of the Clintons, and then we can open it up for questions. First of all, on the issue of money flowing into politics, I happen to believe that people have a First Amendment right to express their political views. So if I am a staunch environmentalist or I believe in a strong national defense and I want to run political advertisements that don't necessarily endorse a campaign but says we need leaders who support the environment or leaders who want a strong national defense, I believe you have a First Amendment right to do so. I also believe that you have a right to make contributions to political candidates. And I think it's good that there are some limits or caps on those like we have today. But here's the problem with the way the current system operates. Anybody here operate in, in finance or the insurance business or have familiarity in that area? Anybody that's operated in that space will tell you when you look at the marketplace in insurance or finance, like any marketplace, you have buyers and sellers of insurance products. The vast bulk of the regulatory restrictions are on who? The sellers the people that are selling insurance projects, products. There are enormous regulatory burdens that are placed on them, very little placed on the buyers. Now let's look at the influence marketplace in Washington, D.C. You have the buyers of influence, which would be outside entities, special interests, corporations, labor unions, and you have the sellers of influence, which are the politicians. Who gets regulated in this marketplace? The buyers the buyers, and that of course is because the rules are written by the sellers. I think the way that you deal with this issue is you start regulating the sellers of influence. If we believe that there is a corrupting culture in Washington, D.C., a revolving around the inflow of money, we should put regulatory controls on the politicians not on the people who are buying influence. So one of the things I proposed, one of the reforms I proposed, is doing in Washington what we already do in 29 states, including the state of Florida where I live. Very, very simple rule in Florida. When the Florida legislature is in session, politicians, what? Cannot solicit or receive campaign contributions, period. Period. Now imagine if we took that rule that's in 29 states and applied it in Washington, D.C. and said members of Congress and senators can't solicit or receive campaign contributions while Congress is in session. Well, I can tell you one thing, we'd have a lot shorter congressional sessions, right? That'd be the first thing that would happen. But something else I think would happen too is some of the extortive properties that operate in the Washington culture would go away because part of the leverage that they have is the mere fact that industries or entities are concerned that Congress is going to do something bad to them. And the sort of Damocles that hangs over them is precisely when Congress is in session. So reforms like that, I think, could have an enormous effect on these sorts of behaviors in Washington, D.C. Second reform I would propose, and that relates to issues of corruption. We absolutely have to recognize, if we believe in limited government, that the problem is no longer philosophical or ideological. It is money-driven. And until you start changing the incentive structures in Washington, D.C., you are going to have people that initially might have advocated for limited government. They suddenly become champions of larger government because that's where the money is. I had a congressman who's uh, simply left public life tell me, you know, the problem is in Washington, when you first get here, it's a cesspool. You stick around for a while, and it starts feeling like a hot tub. It is a corrupting influence. So, for example, term limits. I was not in favor of term limits before. I am now. Second of all, why not a lifetime ban on members of Congress leaving Congress and becoming lobbyists? And why not prevent immediate family members from registering as lobbyists as well. None of these reforms are silver bullets, but we absolutely have to break the back of this profit culture in Washington, D.C., because increasingly, we are a country that has a capital city that looks more like Versailles 
and less like the Washington DC of the 19th century when it was considered a diplomatic outpost that no self-respecting French diplomat would ever want to be posted to. It's become a great city, a wealthy city at our expense. Now, why is it that I singled out the Clintons in my recent book, Clinton Cash? And I want to tell you today it is precisely because they represent a fundamental transformation in the way that money is flowing into politics. Well, how can I say that? Don't they have to abide by the same rules as everyone else? Well, yes and no. If there's one consensus point on money and politics over the last 40 years, it's this. Politics is a dirty game, there's money in politics, but by golly, it's a dirty game that ought to be played just by Americans. We don't want foreign entities, foreign financiers, foreign governments, uh, uh, you know, foreign oligarchs trying to manipulate our political leaders. And to show you how strong this consensus point is, back in 2012, two Canadians challenged the constitutionality of federal law Federal law says foreign nationals cannot contribute to political campaigns, they cannot contribute to super PACs, they cannot give money to political candidates. Two Canadians challenged that law, saying it was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court came back nine to zero, basically saying, are you nuts? Of course it's constitutional, it makes complete sense. Now, when was the last time any Supreme Court decision you heard of was nine to zero? So there is a consensus in our country. We don't want foreign entities trying to influence our political process. Here's the problem. The Clintons have found a way around it. And we have a circumstance today whereby there is a massive infusion of foreign money going to the Clintons that is unaccountable for and that has had a corrupting influence on the decisions that Hillary Clinton made as Secretary of State and going forward, I believe, would have the same effect on her as President. Uh, what are we talking about in terms of numbers? Well, on the speaking fees, we're talking about $160 million. And when it comes to the Clinton Foundation, we're talking about $2 billion. Well, you know, how does this work? What, what am I talking about here? You're basically talking about they use two mechanisms for money to come in to them. One is through the Clinton Foundation. The other is through so-called speaking fees for Bill Clinton. Let me give you just a couple of examples of how this process works. First of all, I want to tell you a story. It's a story about four things. It's about Hillary Clinton. It's about the government of Russia. It's about uranium and it's about $145 million in cash. Now this is a story that has two chapters in my book, Clinton Cash. We shared the findings in the book before it was published with the New York Times investigative team. They went back, confirmed what we found, and when the book came out, they actually ran a 4,000 word front page piece confirming the story that I am now going to tell you. And the story is really quite simple. Back in 2005, a Canadian financier named Frank Justra wanted to get uranium concessions in a country called Kazakhstan, which is run by a very nasty, brutal dictator named Nazarbayev. Justra had wanted these concessions for a long time. They were worth about $500 million, and he couldn't get them. So he decided to get on his plane and bring Bill Clinton with him. Why not bring an ex-president, right? They'll give you the sort of prestige that you want. They showed up in Kazakhstan, and Bill Clinton went about publicly in a press conference praising the leadership of Nazarbayev. Now, Nazarbayev has won every election by 90-something percent. He throws political opponents in jail. He's a brutal dictator. But you wouldn't know it from the press conference that Bill Clinton gave. Bill Clinton not only praised him for his enlightened leadership, he actually said that this man should be the, become the head of an international human rights organization, something that had been rejected by both the uh, Bush administration and Bill Clinton's administration in the 1990s. Bill Clinton praised him, and guess what? The next day, Frank Juster got the uranium concession. Three weeks after that, Frank Juster sent a check to the Clinton Foundation for more than $30 million. Now, the story does not end there, because what Frank Juster does is he takes that uranium concession, he puts it in a company called Uranium One, and he starts buying uranium assets in the United States, in places like Utah and Colorado and Texas. 
when it gets to the point where he has now purchased about 50% of U.S. future uranium production. Flash forward to 2009. Somebody is interested in buying Uranium One, and they're prepared to pay top dollar for it. But there's a problem. You know who wants to buy Uranium One? The Russian government. An entity called Rosatom, which is the Russian State Atomic Nuclear Agency. Rosatom, these are the guys that built the nuclear reactors in Iran. They do nuclear technology exchanges with wonderful people like North Korea. Uh, these, this is the government entity in Russia that controls their nuclear arsenal. And Vladimir Putin believes that uranium is a way for Russia to exert its international control and its international strength. So the Russians want to buy Uranium One. What's the problem? The problem is uranium is a critical industry, and for that reason it falls under the rubric of federal regulations that require several government agencies, including the State Department, to approve the deal. Now, as the Russians make this announcement in 2009, something strange happens with the Uranium One shareholders. Uranium One in Canada that owns all this uranium, it's not a very big company. But you suddenly have this massive uprising of philanthropy. The nine shareholders in this company decide this would be a great time to increase their charitable giving, and even better yet, they decide this is a great time to increase their charitable giving to the Clinton Foundation. So they pony up $145 million to the Clinton Foundation, and lo and behold, three months later, what happens? Hillary Clinton approves the transfer of U.S. uranium assets to the Russian government. The Canadian financiers make out well, the Clintons make out well, the Russian government makes out well, the rest of us are all screwed. But that is an example of how the Clinton Foundation has operated and in a way that has led to the self-enrichment and has led to influence peddling. By the way, the individuals involved in Uranium One, they couldn't make campaign contributions to the Clinton campaign. They couldn't set up a super PAC to help her candidacy, but they could give $145 million to the Clinton Foundation. Let me give you an example now from the speaking fees in the same way in which it works. Now, Bill Clinton, like every president since Eisenhower, hit the lecture circuit after he left the White House. And nobody can fault him for that, at least I don't. I think ex-presidents can do that. But in the Clinton's case, it's a little bit different because Bill Clinton left office as his wife was going into office. First, she was an influential U.S. Senator, then she became Secretary of State. And so Bill Clinton in 2001 was giving paid speeches. He was making about $175,000 per speech. Nice payday. But something strange happens in early 2009. Now this is eight years after he's left office. For most people on the lecture circuit, especially if you're a government official, an ex-president, your speaking fees tend to go down over time, right? You're not as exciting. You don't have great inside stories to tell anymore. It's just the way that things kind of work. But in early 2009, something great happened to Bill Clinton's speaking fees. They went up by about threefold. Now, what else happened in January of 2009? Anybody remember? That's, of course, when Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State. Now, you know, you could perhaps argue that Bill became three times more eloquent, uh, that he was three times smarter, and that's the reason these speaking fees went up. I think it had something to do with his wife now being at the center of U.S. national security decision making. And let me give you just one example of how this works. There's a Swedish telecom company called Ericsson. Now, Ericsson has this habit of selling telecom equipment to oppressive governments around the world. Uh, they sell telecom equipments to Belarus, uh, they sell them to Venezuela, and, of course, most notoriously, they sell it to the government of Iran. And this was a problem for them, first with the Bush administration and then increasingly with Hillary Clinton's State Department. And as I point out in the book, there are lots of State Department cables where we are browbeating the Swedish foreign minister, telling them, you need to get Ericsson in line. They need to stop selling this kind of equipment to the government of Iran. There's movement on Capitol Hill to ban the sale of any telecom equipment to the government of Iran and to basically force Ericsson's hand. There is mounting pressure as this company is named in State Department reports, and all evidence points to aggressive action taken by the federal government against Ericsson. Well, Ericsson thought at this time it might be a great idea 
to pay Bill Clinton for a speech. Now, they had never paid Bill Clinton for a speech before. He'd been on the lecture circuit for 10 years. They had never paid for a speaking fee before, but they decided this would be a great time to do it, and you know, if you're gonna do it, you might as well go in big. So they paid him $750,000 for a 20-minute speech. That's the most that Bill Clinton has ever been paid for a single speech before by Erickson. Bill Clinton gave a speech, and something happened nine days later. Nine days later, the State Department, Hillary State Department, issued a statement under her name which said, we are not going to take action to restrict the conduct of companies like Ericsson. We are going to count on them to, quote unquote, police themselves, which is exactly what Ericsson wanted. Now, some people might say, you look at these examples, the Clintons know a lot of people, they're very busy, these are probably just coincidences. The problem is that this pattern of behavior occurs over and over and over again. And you are left to either one of two conclusions. First of all, maybe the Clintons operate in a parallel universe that is dominated by coincidence in a way that none of us could imagine. <laughs> or, or, the old adage of politics is right, follow the money. And when you follow the money with the Clintons, what you end up with is a circumstance of rampant corruption and self-enrichment. And where does that leave us? That leaves us simply with the case that this is not only about the Clintons, it's about the future of the country. Because if something is not done by the apparatus that the Clintons have set up to take in this large influx of foreign money, this is going to become the wave of the future. And don't be surprised if five years from now, if nothing is done about this, that we don't have a Secretary of Defense whose spouse hits the lecture circuit giving high paid speeds, uh, speeches to foreign entities and they set up a family foundation to take donations from foreign entities that have matters before the Pentagon. Because that is precisely what the Clintons have done and that is what the Clintons say that they are going to continue to do if she becomes President of the United States. So with that I want to say thank you and I'd love to get any questions or comments that you might have. Yes, I think, I think there's some I, microphones out. You can go ahead. I have a, yeah. uh, first of all, a comment. Um, I like the Milka principle, was it? Or the, and the double Milka principle. Yep. My favorite example of that is the farm industry in terms of ethanol versus the petroleum industry. How much ethanol will Congress mandate to be placed in a, a gallon of gasoline? Yep. One benefits, the other loses. There's the competition and hence the price for corruption. Um, I have to say, though, with all due respect, that your modest proposals for reform will not work. Campaign finance reform has been around since about 1906, the, and a series of bills. There is always a way around it. You shorten Congress, you, let, you lengthen the time in which they're going to pay f in advance for what the next session is going to give them. I would just like to suggest that there is a solution, a very radical one perhaps, but something that maybe America is ready to embrace. And that is the idea that to take the money out of politics, you must take the power to enrich special interests away from the politicians, away from Congress. What I propose is uh, a movement to send an army of Mr. Smiths to Washington with the priority of cutting programs and closing agencies, preferably to make government what it was originally meant to be, a protector, not a provider. No, I love the sentiment, and I think you're right. I think the problem is that you've got to at least institute some structural reforms. It's not a question of getting, quote unquote, good people into politics. Don't get me wrong, there are good people in politics, and I want good people running, but the system is corrupting. And my worldview and my faith tells me that, you know, people get tempted. People are corrupted. You give them power. You give them the ability to make money. They will resist. They will resist. They will resist. And some of, some of them will continue to resist. But a lot of them eventually will give in and succumb. So I agree with you that, that there is no silver bullet. Um, but I do think that the way reform is going to work is it's going to be, you know, death by a thousand cuts. And you've got to have a series of reforms, but we've got to make this a priority. And here's the problem right now. 
And both sides of the aisle do this. The mindset is basically, yeah, my guy may be corrupt, but he's my guy, and their guy's a lot worse. Uh, and both sides do that. And my problem is, look, w what you have in Washington, D.C. is a permanent political class. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that there aren't partisan differences between Republicans and Democrats, but when it comes to these issues, there ain't a whole lot of difference. And, and here's the analogy I would use with you. Um, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and when I was 12 years old, I turned on Channel 13, which was a, a, a small independent channel, and I discovered the wonderful world of professional wrestling. And these were large men in spandex outfits that were hitting each other with chairs, throwing each other out of the ring, and I thought as a 13-year-old, this is awesome! <laughs> now, I hate to break it to you guys, some of you guys, but it's all fake. It's all fake. And, and here's the thing, when you watch it, you think these guys hate each other. I mean, they are pounding each other, they are pulling hair, they are flinging them out of the ring. They hate each other. They don't hate each other, they're business partners. And in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. They want to create the impression that they are throwing each other out of the ring, that they hate each other, but they are business partners at some realm, and that is that neither political party, their establishments, are interested in any kind of these reforms because they've got it good. You've got lobbying firms now where Republicans and Democrats are going into business together, so it's now bipartisan lobbying because that way they can cover both sides. Um, so, you know, my point would be there is no silver bullet, but we've got to make this a priority, and I argue for both sides to have zero tolerance. If the person on your side is enriching themselves, let's not make excuses. Nobody's irreplaceable. We can find somebody better to get into that position to do better. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Um, I have to say again, um, I'm Alice Labrie, and I'm former U.S. Department of State Foreign Service. I'm also a Republican in Harlem. Uh, do you have a family? I do. <laughs> okay. Sir, I think you better be careful about your safety. Thank you. Thank you. We do, we do take precautions in that way, but I thank you. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let, let him get the microphone here so everybody can hear it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always thought that just a reinstatement of Glass-Steagall would have been sufficient. Right. So why did they do Dodd-Frank? And I like your idea about the fact that it was a full employment bill for the people who wrote it. But what about the crony capitalistic aspect where they, these companies, these bills are written to the advantage of big banks like Bank America and so forth to the extreme disadvantages of the small local banks who don't have the staff to comply with them. Yes, no, that, that's a great point. One of the biggest myths in American politics is that big business hates regulation. Big business loves regulation. Why? Because they can, they can comply much easier than their smaller competitors. So big business and big governments are not at each other's throats. And again, I think there's a certain professional wrestling aspect there. People in Washington need to say that they're taking on the big banks in Wall Street and that they're taking on the big oil companies. When it actually comes to the implementation of reforms or changes, they are done in such a manner where they're done to the detriment of weaker competitors who cannot comply. Uh, and that is an absolute reality. So you're right. This is, this is multi-layered. And I think one of the biggest arguments, that, the things that we can try to do to get our neighbors is to get them to start thinking about government not as a philosophical competition between liberals and conservatives, although that, that is important, but to think of it in business terms. Think of it in business terms. It's a business model. There are people that are making decisions in Washington not based on whether this conforms with the Constitution or whether this is something my progressive, progressive views would embrace. They think of it in terms of how do I monetize this. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. Yes, sir, over here. Yeah, two, uh, two questions. Uh, one, what about the idea of uh, raising uh, salaries for uh, legislators uh, to very substantial amounts of money, so there's, you know, there's just less incentive. And secondly, what what's wrong with uh, allowing people to give how much, however much money they want to their candidate? Uh, you know, it's a free country; it's your money. Why, why not uh, allow it? That would help uh, raise money for campaigns, and you know, let individuals give whatever they want. 
you know, two, two uh, good questions. Um, I think that um, on the issue of um, campaign contributions, here's part of the problem. The smart people in Washington, D.C. have figured out a way to use campaign contributions and more specifically donations to political action committees to subsidize their own lifestyles. So when you are making a campaign contribution to a so-called leadership PAC, uh, and, and pretty much, you know, you look at the term leadership PAC and you assume it's only the leaders that have them, there are actually people that are running for Congress who haven't been elected yet who create leadership PACs. And what does the leadership PAC say? It allows you to take in $10,000 a year from a contributor, and unlike a campaign committee or unlike a super PAC, there are really basically no restrictions on how that money is spent. Uh, we did a, a story, uh, I think 2013, with 60 Minutes on this, and you would be amazed uh, at the things that they use this for. They use them to, uh, to buy sporting events tickets. They, you know, anybody here a college football fan? Members of Congress use the leadership pack money to take the family to the, to the uh, you know, college football championship. They get box seats at Yankee games. They use it for a private limousine service. They use it for babysitter service. They take the family to Edinburgh, Scotland as a quote unquote fact finding mission. So the problem is, is that campaign contributions are not just about helping get somebody elected. They're now about subsidizing somebody's lifestyle. And by the way, it's tax free, right? Politician doesn't pay taxes on the leadership PAC money, so if I use it to hire a babysitter, that's not coming from tax dollars, that's coming from somebody else's money. So I understand the theoretical argument that people have a First Amendment right to contribute as much as they want to, and, and if it's disclosed, what's wrong with it? The problem is, is that it's not a system that is just about electing people, it's a system about self-enrichment. And if somebody could plunk down a million dollars into a congressman's uh, leadership PAC, I mean, imagine the kind of lifestyle that they would exist. As far as salaries are concerned, uh, I think it's an intriguing idea. Um, I think, you know, you may not have heard it there, but I heard the murmuring in the room. I don't think there's an appetite for paying these guys more. Um, and, and I think that is a problem. I also think, by the way, that it's not something that is drawn out of, um, you know, poverty or a lack of money. I think it's a mindset. I think it's a mindset. And the analogy I would use is that, um, you know, corruption is not just about people that wish they had more money and they just don't have enough. Look at insider trading on Wall Street. I mean, some of the biggest indictments have been to people worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and I think it's the same thing in Washington, D.C. I think it's an attitude and a mindset of entitlement that motivates them, not so much that, you know, they're scraping by on, on, on money and it's hard for them to, uh, to get by. So, but great questions. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, you did a great job of talking about elected officials, and you've, of course, described Angela Cotavia's country class versus ruling class. Did you, would you care to comment about the, um, the non-elected officials, the staffers, and the administrative state, the EPA, and people like that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the same, the same principles I talked about, complexity is good, simplicity is bad, rules that have real teeth that can end somebody in jail, but are difficult to understand and comply with. Uh, this is the bread and butter of the environmental consulting industry. And if you look at the environmental consulting industry, and here's how it research this, by the way. Go on the websites of environmental consulting firms, and by the way, do the same thing for financial regulatory consultants. It's amazing what you'll find. You will find them making statements like, Bill joined the firm in 2013. In 2012, he wrote the such and such bill that is essential for you to understand. I mean, they're that blatant about it. So you're quite right. This is not just about congressional staffers. It's about bureaucrats in the EPA and other rule makers who can create complex rules that are hard for people to understand, and then they can quit their jobs and start consult consulting firms. And to me, this is a huge problem. You elect a Republican, you re put Republicans in the Senate and the House that are anti-regulation, this problem is not going to go away because ultimately it's hard to pay attention to all the rules that are being written. What you have to do is change the incentive structure, and one of the things that I would call for is if you work for the, for the EPA or you involved in rulemaking, you cannot do consulting in that area for five years. A lot of people would say that's draconian, but I don't know how else you can try to create disincentives for this kind of behavior to take place. But I think it absolutely has to be done. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, 
In your book, uh, I was very interested by how the Clintons had uh, moments where they suddenly saw things uh, differently, okay? Uh, and one you mentioned was non-proliferation and uh, India. Could you just tell the group a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so, you know, the Clintons have always been in favor of uh, the non-proliferation treaty, MPT. This goes back to, you know, their formative years in politics when Bill was the uh, president of the United States. India, you might recall, did a surprise underground test of nuclear weapons, and Clinton was furious because he felt it made him look bad, and it was basically slapping the face of the MPT treaty. So he slapped on heavy regulations and restrictions on the export of U.S. nuclear technology to India, whether it's for civilian purposes or for nuclear purposes. So, and that's pretty much the way that it remained. Uh, then in 2005, the Bush administration decided to do or to consider nuclear cooperation with the Indian government. They wanted India to become more pro-American, and they said maybe we should sa share nuclear technology, but this would require a change in the law by Congress. And I recount this in the book. I mean, Indian officials are very sort of open about this. They quickly identified that on the Democrat side, the person they needed to target was Hillary Clinton. She was a powerful member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. A lot of people look for her to leadership on these issues. So guess what happened? You had Indian industrialists who had never given to the Clinton Foundation before, started writing large checks. Uh, you had uh, Bill uh, got some speaking gigs from Indian entities. Um, and there were really two people that were involved in this. One of them is an Indian politician who uh, has been accused of bribery and charged with bribery numerous times named Amar Singh. Now, Amar Singh met Bill Clinton in 2005, right when this was going on. And if you go to the Clinton Foundation disclosures of their contributors, um, which they were required to do by uh, President Obama, by the way. Don't let them convince you they did that voluntarily. It was a condition of her being appointed Secretary of State. President Obama, in his wisdom, said, you need to disclose all your contributors. Well, one of the contributors they disclosed is a guy named Amar Singh. And they disclosed him as a contributor of between one and five million dollars. Well, you call up Amar Singh, and he said, I didn't make that contribution. And when you look at his financial disclosures in the Indian Parliament, that, that's more than his entire net worth. So the question becomes, who actually made that contribution from Amar Singh? Now, Amar Singh came back later and said, well, you know, maybe that contribution was made in my name by somebody else. Uh, but Amar Singh, in 2008, when there was a crucial vote coming up on the Indian nuclear deal, which Hillary Clinton had opposed, he got a two-hour meeting with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton came out in favor of the uh, nuclear technology going to India, and much like the Russia example, you know, everybody was better off except arguably the United States because we got bad leadership. The Clintons got lots of money in the form of speaking fees and donations to the foundation. A foreign entity, in this case the Indian government, got what they wanted, and the rest of us got very poor leadership. By the way, uh, one of the people involved in this is a guy named Sant Chatwal, who was later convicted for making illegal campaign contributions to the Clintons. He actually, after the Indians got the nuclear deal signed in the United States, visited his home country. He had lived in New York, was a hotelier, went back to India where he received the largest civilian, uh, the most substantial civilian prize that the Indian government could, could win. And you know what the press release said? The press release said he won that award because he got Hillary Clinton to change her mind on this issue. So that, that is how it works. And there are numerous examples of her, you know, changing her position after money showed up. Other questions? Yes, sir, right there. I think there's a microphone right behind you. And then we'll go right here. Uh, I just like to know if you think there is any chance of changing the status quo with a Donald Trump or a Ted Cruz in office. Cruz talking about the Washington cartel, uh, Trump of course just talking about the establishment um, and any prospects of reform. Uh, that's a good question. You know, look, one thing you can say about uh, Ted Cruz and Donald Trump is there are a lot of people in Washington, D.C. that don't like them. 
Uh, that could be for different reasons. I think with Cruz, you've got somebody who has got uh, some pretty strong philosophical views that he has expressed. Um, with Trump, it's, it's, uh, it's maybe less philosophical, it's more visceral or emotive. But what I find is that if you look at basically the four candidates that are less, left, God bless John Kasich, but I don't view him as being left in the, in the, the mix of things, three of them are anti-establishment. You've got Ted Cruz, you've got Donald Trump, and then you've got Bernie Sanders. And, you know, people say to me, um, you know, well, you know, Bernie Sanders is for big government, and yes, he is, but he's also anti-establishment. I mean, many of the things we talk about, um, you know, the, the crony capitalism are things that, that Bernie Sanders has been critical of. Now, his solutions are all wrong. Uh, because his solution is more government, which I argue would lead to more cronyism. But three of the four remaining candidates are anti-establishment, and I think that says something. Um, so, yes, I am optimistic. In the business that I'm in, you have to be an optimist by nature, because otherwise you would not get out of bed in the morning. So, yes, I am optimistic. All right. Uh, this will be the last question of the session. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Okay, I'm Julie Wars again. In, in, a, in a broad sense, this is not the first time in history that we have seen what uh, has come to be called the nomenclaturas taking advantage of or victimizing the subject. And the last um, memorable time, this led directly to La Bastille. So do you think that uh, we are on our way to La Bastille? And how far are we if we are? Uh, that's a very good question. Look, I think what you're seeing right now is uh, people expressing their anger and their frustration with what's gone on in Washington, D.C. We were having a, a conversation at, at lunch, um, very enjoyable conversation, and I gave people my theory of Donald Trump's rise. A lot of people say they didn't see it coming. They, you know, some people are like, I don't understand his appeal. And, you know, here's my theory. My theory, anybody out here a Clint Eastwood fan? Okay, I love Clint Eastwood. Great movie, Fistful of Dollars. It's one of the old Italian spaghetti westerns. Um, Fistful of Dollars is basically about a small town that has had a succession of sheriffs who just, you know, completely get beat out by this gang, and this gang dominates this town. So what does the town do? They decide to find the nastiest, surliest gunfighter, Clint Eastwood, and pay him a lot of money to clean up the town. And, and the guy does. He comes in and he basically shoots all the bad guys, shoots at the town, and wins. My contention is a lot, of, of, a lot of Trump supporters are hoping that Donald Trump is Clint Eastwood. In other words, they sent people to Washington, D.C. They've, they've sent people to Washington, D.C. Um, who are these hapless sheriffs who may be well-intentioned and are not corrupt, but they just don't get the job done. So let's bring in a guy uh, to do the job. Now, anytime somebody tells a member of the town that the Clint Eastwood character is bad and nasty and terrible, they have no problem with that, right? <laughs> He's got a very precise job to do. And you find the same thing, you find the same thing among Trump supporters. I mean, I, you know, I personally am not a Trump supporter, but you know, I would certainly vote for him in a general election. But, you know, you go to people who are ardent Trump supporters, and, and I'd say, oh, you know, he said this and he said that. Doesn't that bother you? And they'd be like, not really. We need somebody like that to go and clean up Washington. So um, I think there is an attitude and a mood in the country uh, that may not be quite at storming the barricades, uh, but it's pretty bad. I mean, 75% of the American people believe that Washington, D.C., is there's rampant corruption. 75% believe that the federal government in some way represents a threat to them. These are not good numbers. Uh, and the question becomes, you know, where does it all lead? I ultimately have a lot of faith in the American people. Uh, I do not believe we're at a point where, uh, you know, things cannot be turned around. But the question becomes, are people, A, going to be focused... You know, are they going to care? And number two, are they going to focus and channel uh, their frustration and anger in a constructive way? And, 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 and time will tell. So again, I'm optimistic on these accounts, but what I see swirling around on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, is business as usual is no longer acceptable, and part of the reason is because there's so much darn corruption. And you look at the two polar opposites, Donald Trump and, and Bernie Sanders, what is the thing that people say about Donald Trump? He's too rich to be bought. 
Now, you can argue whether that's true or not, but part of the appeal is that he cannot be corrupted. And you will hear people on the left say the same thing about Bernie Sanders. I may not agree with Bernie on everything, but I don't think Bernie can be bought. So we are at a point in the country where there is uh, you know, critical interest in this, and I just hope that there are enough people in Washington that take this opportunity to do something constructive with it and to make meaningful change. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.